82, a psalm of Asaph. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I wonder if your worldview is malleable enough to welcome the biblical reality presented to us here in verse 1. God, capital G, the Hebrew word is Elohim, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, little g, plural, same Hebrew word, Elohim. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Psalm 82 suggests that our God, our triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Most High God, elsewhere called by his revealed name, Yahweh, is surrounded by other Elohim gods who make up his heavenly court. And Yahweh is not happy with these gods. Now this requires some explanation. However, you're not going to like the explanation if your worldview from the get-go adopts the materialist perspective of our age. That reality basically consists only of what we can see and touch with God thrown in on top. Yet, the Bible indicates that there is a much larger, unseen, supernatural reality that stands behind this world. Some of it, for whatever reason, is evil and disloyal to Yahweh. It's a reality conveniently ignored by our modern era, perhaps by means of a grand deception. Now, we don't have full clarity on this unseen realm, and we must be careful in our assessments, but there are some scriptural clues breadcrumbs, if you will. There's the account in Daniel chapter 10 where Daniel is visited by an angel who delivers to him a message, and when the angel comes to Daniel, the angel says to him, Daniel, I would have been here sooner, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days, and Michael had to come to assist me. Now, most scholars agree in this story that this is Michael, the archangel, and that this prince of the kingdom of Persia or the ruler of the kingdom of Persia is a divine being. Now, when I say divine here, I don't mean a being worthy of being worshipped. I mean a supernatural being. That this, king, this prince of Persia is a supernatural being with some sort of geographical rule or domain. This is not even to mention the account in Genesis chapter 6 where the sons of God transgress their proper domain in order to have sexual relations with the daughters of men. Now that's for another sermon. It's not the sermon you're going to get today. We'll, we'll let Greg take that one someday. 
We have hints of this unseen world in the New Testament as well. In our rush to individualize the atonement of Christ, we sometimes fail to put his work into wider perspective. So Jesus speaks of himself as binding and destroying the works of Satan. Jesus casts out the ruler of this world. Jesus heals those who are oppressed by demons. And the Apostle Paul tells us that our current battle is not against flesh and blood, but, quote, against the rulers, authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. That's the battle that we're in. Yet the outcome of this battle is certain because Christ has disarmed the rulers and the authorities by his death, putting them to open shame, Colossians 2. He has been raised far above all rule and dominion and authority, Ephesians chapter 1. And before Jesus one day, every knee will bow, knees in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Philippians 2. Psalm 82 fits into this same string of fascinating passages by giving us a small glimpse at this spiritual world. A glimpse at a cosmic corruption of an unseen realm that simultaneously plays itself out in a fallen earth. At the same time, our psalm celebrates the prospect that Yahweh is a loving God who has good planned for all the nations, all the people groups of the world, a plan that will not be thwarted by any other gods. Now let me just say that there will be some new and challenging things you hear from God's word today. Your paradigms may be shaken just a little bit. I need you to think hard with me as we seek to pull all the pieces together. I'm going to give you a a lot of information today, more than I often would. And so if uh, you get lost at any point, please feel free to come and ask me for my notes. I'd be happy to send them to you. You will have a lot of questions. And I'll try to answer as many as I can while also being as practical as possible. So here's how I want to proceed through Psalm 82. I'm going to ask and answer four questions raised by our text, and then we're going to spend some time supporting each of these answers from Psalm 82 and from the rest of Scripture, all right? So that's, that's going to be our time together, four questions and answers. So let's dive in. Question number one, whom is Yahweh addressing in Psalm 82? Whom is Yahweh addressing in Psalm 82? So I'm going to give you the answer right off the bat, and then we'll develop it. So here's the answer. You ready? Yahweh is addressing a council of disloyal, supernatural beings or gods over which Yahweh rules. A council of disloyal supernatural beings over which Yahweh rules. Hey, it seems clear enough, right? Look again at verse 1. Look again at verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods he holds judgment. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that the same Hebrew word, Elohim, stands behind both God, capital G, and behind God's, lowercase g, plural. So we need to say something about this word, Elohim, and in the process, unlearn some things about this word. Elohim, this word is always plural in form. It's only plural in form, but it can be singular or plural in meaning depending on its context. So, for example, its first use here in verse 1 must be singular because the verb has taken is singular. Hence, God has taken, 
singular. But his second use in verse 1 is plural because in the midst of requires more than one. Hence, in the midst of the gods. But that only compounds our confusion because, wait, Chris, there's only one Elohim, right? Right? Commence the unlearning. The late Michael Heiser identifies the crux of the problem for us. Quote, when we see the word God, G-O-D, we instinctively think of a particular divine being with a unique set of attributes, omnipresence, omnipotence, sovereignty, and so on. But this is not how a biblical writer thought about the term Elohim. Biblical authors did not assign a specific set of attributes to the word Elohim. In other words, we usually think of Elohim as a specific title, or even a name for the one creator God, but the word is broader and more generic. And this is evident when you examine the use of the word Elohim in the Old Testament. So throughout the Hebrew scriptures, this word Elohim refers to a diverse number of entities. Let me just give you the list. In various ways, in various places, Elohim refers to Yahweh himself, members of his heavenly court, the gods of the four nations, angels, demons, and even the disembodied spirit of dead Samuel. All of those entities in the Hebrew Bible are referred to by this word Elohim. Now, what ties such a list together? Well, it's certainly not common attributes among this list. You have both demons and Yahweh himself. And certainly, not all of these beings are worthy of being worshipped. But notice what they do have in common. They are all inhabitants of the spiritual world and are not, at least by nature, members of this embodied world. Michael Heiser says that this word Elohim is a place of residence term. Elohim is a zip code of sorts, denoting any supernatural being existing in the heavenly realm. What kind of supernatural being, their rank, their role, their attributes, that all has to be revealed in other ways apart from this one broad term, Elohim. Now let me be clear, however, where the Bible is clear. Yahweh is incomparable and unique in a class of his own. What is predicated of him is never said about any other being. As the only eternal, self-existent creator, he rules over or judges all other Elohim just as he rules over and judges everything in this visible creation. Look, look down at verse 6. Skim your eyes down to verse 6. Verse 6 tells us that Yahweh is the most high. Do you see that in verse 6? He is the most high among these sons of God, which is another Old Testament phrase used to describe supernatural beings. But verse 6 tells us that Yahweh is the most high. He is exalted over anything and everyone else. Back in Exodus 15, Moses asked this rhetorical question, who is like you among the gods, Yahweh? The answer is, no one. And the psalmist proclaims in Psalm 97, you, O Yahweh, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. No other Elohim compares to Yahweh. Let's be clear where the Bible is clear. But this is why 
The Old Testament's central confession of faith says this, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. You will have no other gods before him. So nothing that I've been saying up to this point, nothing in Psalm 82 undermines a proper understanding of monotheism. There is only one God, one Elohim, who is worthy of and demanding of our worship. There is only one true God. But there are other Elohim, according to Psalm 82. And many scholars, understandably uncomfortable with this notion, if not properly nuanced, as I've sought to do here, Many scholars seek for an, an alternative reading of this psalm, just to sort of distance themselves from any sort of conflict or confusion. And one option that they take, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because some translations actually just go this way. But one option is to view these plural Elohim in verse 1 as a metaphorical way to describe rulers among the people of Israel. But I don't think that works for a number of reasons. One, nowhere else are mere humans called Elohim. Two, this divine counsel in verse one is located not on earth, but in heaven, according to Psalm 89. Three, here in our psalm, the concern is not with the people of Israel. The concern is with the nations of the earth. Look down in verse eight. It's the nations that are in purview here. And fourth reason why I don't think this uh, understanding of Elohim as humans works, Jesus actually quotes this psalm, Psalm 82 in John chapter 10, to substantiate his claim that he is more than a mere man, that he is instead divine, and more than that, that he is one with his Father, he is Yahweh himself come in the flesh. Okay, so we're already deep into it here. Let me sum up where we've gotten so far. Yahweh rules, presides over a council of supernatural beings or Elohim, and that's whom he addresses here in Psalm 82. He's not addressing human rulers or judges. Now, don't picture here, when you hear this word council, divine council, don't picture a collaborative corporate board meeting in heaven. That's not what's being described here. Think more of an assembly, an army charged with affirming and then executing Yahweh's wise and sovereign purposes. And yet some in this council are disloyal to Yahweh, presumably having rebelled at some point, which is actually something we know very little about biblically. Nevertheless, Yahweh is going to bring down the hammer of judgment on this group of Elohim. Do you see that at the end of verse 1? He holds judgment among this group. Why? Why is he bringing judgment? Well, that leads us to question number two. Question number two, why does Yahweh condemn these gods? Why does Yahweh condemn these gods? All right, I'm going to give you the answer. Are you ready for this? Answer, they have ruled the nations of the earth corruptly. They have ruled the nations of the earth corruptly. Now, this is interesting. At one level, this answer is pretty clear from the rest of our psalm, but it raises another issue that we're going to have to discuss, namely, why do these Elohim even have some level of authority over the nations in the first place? But first things first, let's read the rest of the psalm, 
And I'm going to make some running comments as we go, so keep your fingers ready and nimble. We'll start in verse 2. In verse 2, this is Yahweh speaking to this council of Elohim. Verse 2, how long will you judge? Uh, judge and rule sometimes are, uh, are, are, are synonyms in the Old Testament. And so the idea here is not simply that God is a, a, a judge like we think of one, but he is the sovereign ruler over all of this. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? In other words, among these nations, these Elohim are favoring and helping the wicked of society. Verse 3, give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the rights of the afflicted and the destitute. This reflects the character of Yahweh, This is who he is. This is what he wants. This is how he would rule. Verse 4. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. And then we get to verse 5. Now in verse 5, this is either a comment on the corrupt Elohim, or more likely, it's a comment on the state of weak and needy humanity who are like sheep without a shepherd, having been misled by these corrupt Elohim. Verse 5, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. And then in verses 6 through 8, as a result of their corruption, Yahweh judges these Elohim. Verse 6, I said... You are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. So any status, any immortality will be lost. They will go the way of Satan himself. And then verse 8, it's the people hearing all of this and urging Yahweh to act. Verse 8, arise, O God. Judge the earth. In in other words, set things right. And this entails, you, O Yahweh, shall inherit all the nations. All right, let's summarize again. So Yahweh passes judgment on these gods of the nations for their wicked corruption, for their partiality, for their lack of justice within their limited domains. They have deceived the peoples, leading them away from true righteousness. And of course, such corruption is matched by the behavior of human rulers here on earth. There's always a connection between the two. But it raises the question, how did these Elohim come to administrate these nations in the first place such that Yahweh needs to inherit them for himself in verse 8? What's the background of what's happening here? Well, that word inherit in verse 8 is a clue. Inherit. And it takes us back to a crucial story in biblical history. And I want us to go back there so you can better understand what's happening in Psalm 82. So will you turn back in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 8 and 9. Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9. Travis spent some time in this uh, passage last week. We're going to spend some time here as well. This is the Song of Moses. It comes right at the end of the Torah. Here Moses is looking back on everything that has happened in creation up to this point. Page 174, if you're using one of the Bibles. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. When the Most High... Now, we already know who that is. We've seen that in our psalm. That's Yahweh. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, I want you to hold that phrase in your head. He divided mankind. He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Let's pause here for a minute. Now, this is, once again, strange. But this is a correct translation. 
the sons of God. And what it means is that the division of the nations or people groups corresponds to the number of these supernatural beings in the divine council, these Elohim. Then look at verse 9. There's a contrast that's drawn. But Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob, a.k.a. Israel. Okay, you with me so far? Let me ask you a question. When did Yahweh divide or separate mankind into its various clans? Some of you know this, just yell it out. Babel, Tower of Babel in Genesis 10 and 11, the Tower of Babel. Now that event, the Tower of Babel, is theologically significant for the rest of the biblical narrative. There at Babel, humanity rebelled against Yahweh's mandate to fill the earth, to multiply and fill the earth. Instead, what did they do? They decided, let's congregate together in one place, build a city, make a name for ourselves, and build a tower to heaven, and we can be like gods. And so thus, in judgment, God divides or separates the people He disinherits the nations, and according to Scripture, in a number of different places, in judgment, he assigns these nations to these lesser corrupt Elohim. Whoa. But there's also mercy. There's mercy. God has a plan. In grace, He calls one people into existence through whom he has a long-term goal of eventually blessing the nations. But that's to get ahead of ourselves. It's not a coincidence that there are, depending on how you count, 70 distinct nations divided at Babel, and Jewish tradition posits 70 of these fallen sons of God in the divine council. But if you want another confirmatory verse, listen to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. You don't need to turn there if you don't want to. You can just listen. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 19 and 20, Moses speaking here for God. He says, beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Now listen, listen carefully. Things that the Lord your God has allotted or assigned to all the peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of Egypt, Israel, to be a people of his own inheritance. So, Yahweh did this in response to human rebellion as a judgment. Humanity, you want to be like God? Then I'm going to give you over to these lesser Elohim. But here, now, in Psalm 82, Yahweh is going to judge these assigned Elohim for their mistreatment of these same nations. So notice what's going on. Before Yahweh, no one gets away with anything. Now, I want to pause here in the midst of all of this strangeness. Someone came up to me after the first service and said, man, this text is bananas. I want to pause here in the midst of all this strangeness and say something practical. It's a warning, actually. Don't let a fascination with this topic, the happenings of the unseen realm, lead you to make contact with any of these spiritual beings. We seek after and listen to the voice of the Lord alone as he speaks in Christ and in his word. There's a reason why the Bible reserves the harshest language and the harshest punishment for mediums, for sorcerers, and for practitioners of divination. What that means for us today, and maybe this is more so true for some young people among us, you must get rid of your Ouija boards. 
your tarot cards, your crystals, your psychics. These are not harmless games. Psalm 82 reminds us that other supernatural beings are real and many of them are corrupt and evil, yet they masquerade as angels of light. Deception is their tactic. Falsehood and lies, which leads to enslavement and oppression. You don't need their insight. You don't need their advice. You don't need their perspective on your life. You will receive no better news, no more encouraging message than that which has already been delivered and publicly proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel tells us what our problem is. We don't need to find that anywhere else. The gospel tells us what our deepest need is. And the gospel provides the solution. We are sinners, unable to help ourselves, spiritually dead, but Christ came to forgive us of our sins, to set us free, and to grant us new life. And we can enjoy this salvation by turning to and trusting in Jesus Christ alone. Let any contrary message or messenger be damned. And those aren't my words, those are Paul's words in Galatians 1. Question number three. The next two will go quick. (laughs) Question number three. What is Yahweh's plan for the nations? What is Yahweh's plan for the nations? Answer, he intends to bless the nations by bringing them to himself. He intends to bless the nations by bringing them to himself. Look again at verse 8. Verse 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. So notice the connection between judgment on all that's been happening and this inheriting of the nations. The two go together. So when this judgment against these Elohim for their misleading the earth is finally meted out at the time when this finally occurs, then deception will be broken and nations will fully belong once again to the loving care of their creator who intends to redeem those who put their faith in him. And this was always Yahweh's plan, even after the rebellion at the Tower of Babel. When he called Abraham to himself, he promised that through Abraham's offspring, he would bless all the peoples of the earth. When he delivered Israel from Egypt, Yahweh told them, if you obey me, you will be my treasured possession among all the peoples, but indeed, all the earth is mine. Israel was always intended to be the preview of Yahweh blessing all the nations with his saving love. They were the conduit through which God's blessing would become universal. And more specifically, Israel's king in Genesis chapter 49 is promised the obedience of all the peoples. The prophets speak of a day when the nations will stream to Yahweh and to his Messiah. And then the same picture is found all the way at the end of the Bible, the very end of the book of Revelation, as the nations experience healing in the new creation, and they worship the Lord in gladness. So Psalm 82 looks ahead and calls Yahweh to act in this way. Judge the earth, O God. Do it because all of the nations belong to you. We want this to happen. May it be so. But when and how does it actually happen? That's question number four. How does Yahweh judge the gods and inherit the nations? How does Yahweh judge the gods and inherit the nations? It's a one-word answer. I hope you know what it is. Jesus. Jesus. It's through Jesus and his work. 
Now, I've already mentioned that Jesus quotes Psalm 82 in John chapter 10, and he applies it to himself. He is no mere man. He places himself among these Elohim, but he actually says more than that in John chapter 10. He says, I and the Father are one. Jesus is the Most High, ruling over every other so-called God. And Jesus' arrival as the Most High on earth suggests that the time of ultimate judgment is here. It corresponds with Jesus' arrival. I mean, what is Jesus doing in his miraculous signs and wonders but destroying the power of spiritual darkness? And then consider Luke chapter 10. Do you remember what happens in Luke 10? Jesus is going to send out some of his followers. Do you remember how many he sends out? 70. That's significant, isn't it? It's the same number of nations that were disinherited at Babel. Jesus sends out 70 of his disciples to go to the nations proclaiming the presence of God's kingdom. Yahweh is coming to rule. He's up to something. He's doing something. And when those disciples return to Jesus and tell him everything that they experience, Jesus remarks, yeah, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Fall like any prince, just like in Psalm 82. The hope of Psalm 82 is being fulfilled and actualized in and through Jesus. It's in the ministry and the death and the resurrection of Christ that the heavenly rulers are judged and put to open shame. They're stripped of any lasting authority. It's through Jesus that Satan and his army is now bound and they are kept from deceiving entire peoples. Those nations, the Gentiles, are being brought near to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, because of his victory over death, is given all authority, where? In heaven and on earth. And so he tells his followers, he tells us, okay, now go and make disciples of all nations. Through Christ, Yahweh intends to bless the nations if they will but trust him if peoples will turn to him. One quick practical application here as we close. You too, because of Christ, if you put your faith in him, you too have a delegated authority over the forces of spiritual darkness. You don't have to be enslaved any longer to evil, to lies, to fear, to deception. You are able in Christ to withstand the accusations of the evil one. The Holy Spirit has equipped you, Christian, with armor, spiritual armor. Ephesians chapter 6. Put on that armor and stand firm in Christ by holding fast to the promises of his word. Go to his word and see what it says about who you are and your identity. Go to the word to see what has been promised to you because of Jesus and what he has purchased. This is how the delegated authority of Jesus will come to bear in your life by taking up the sword of the Spirit. So keep your eyes fixed on Christ. Keep your heart devoted to him alone. We'll end here, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. The Apostle Paul, he says, Although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Worship him alone. Let's pray. 
So Lord, even though some of these concepts are new and strange to us, grant that we would have certainty and confidence in the powerful and finished work of Jesus Christ, that his death and resurrection not only delivers us from our sin, but that it destroys all spiritual evil that would seek to oppose you. Strengthen us by the Holy Spirit to walk in loyalty to Christ, our triumphant King, and it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen.